there depends on the event being registered in several elsewheres, then it would seem that the ethical claim of the event takes place always in a here and a there that are fundamentally bound to one another. In one sense, the event is always emphatically local, since it's precisely the people there whose bodies are on the line. But if those bodies on the line are not registered elsewhere, there is no global response and also no global form of ethical recognition and connection. Something of the reality of the event is actually lost. And it's not just that one discrete population views another at certain me media moments, but that such a response makes evident a form of global connectedness, however provisional, with those whose lives and actions are registered in that way. In short, to be unprepared for the media image that overwhelms can lead not to paralysis, but rather to a situation of being moved and so acting precisely by virtue of being acted upon and being at once there and here and in different ways, accepting and negotiating the multi-locality of ethical connections we might rightly call global. Can we then turn to some versions of ethical philosophy in order to reformulate what it means to register an ethical demand during these times that is reducible neither to consent nor to established agreement and that takes us outside of established community bonds. I will then consider briefly some arguments by Emmanuel Levinas and Hannah Arendt on these vexed relations that hold among ethics proximity and distance. As I seek to articulate a version of cohabitation that follows from the account of ethical obligation I am describing here today, both of these thinkers offer views that are both illuminating and problematic. So I'll be elaborating their views for my own purpose, but I'll also be showing exactly where I must break with them. In order to make matters finally more politically concrete, I hope to turn to the example of Palestine-Israel toward the end of my remarks when I hope it will be possible to understand from these two Jewish thinkers an alternative view of cohabitation, one that is at a critical distance from uh, the view of Jewish politics that is elaborated by the Israeli state, by contemporary versions of political Zionism and its um, allegiance to settler colonialism. But you'll have to wait a little while before I get there. There are um, two dissonant dimensions of Levinas's ethical philosophy. On the one hand, there's the importance of the category of proximity to his idea of ethical relations. Indeed, it seems that the ways that others act upon us without our will, prior to our will, constitutes the occasion of an ethical appeal or solicitation. This means we are acted on and solicited ethically prior to any clear sense of choice. To be impinged upon by another assumes a bodily proximity and it's the face that acts upon us and we are to a certain extent affected and claimed by that face at the same time. On the other hand, our ethical obligations extend to those who are not proximate in any physical sense and do not have to be part of a recognizable community to which we both belong. Indeed, for Levinas, those who act upon us are clearly other to us, and necessarily so, and it is precisely not by virtue of their sameness that we are bound to them. Okay, at least this is um, the explicit proposition he makes in his ethical philosophy, whether or not he turns out to subscribe to that consistently it will be a second question we'll turn to in a moment. Indeed, Levinas sustained some contradictory views on this question of the otherness of the other, who makes an ethical claim on me. He clearly affirmed forms of nationalism, especially Israeli nationalism. He also held to the notion, very controversial, that only within a Judeo-Christian tradition were ethical relations possible. But let us for the moment read him against himself or read him for the political possibilities he opens up 
even those he never intended, even those he would explicitly refute. Levinas's position, his ethical position, allows us the following conclusion. That the set of ethical values by which one population is bound to another in no way depends on those two populations bearing similar marks of national, cultural, religious, or racial belonging. It's interesting that Levinas insists that we're bound to those we do not know, and even those we did not choose, could never have chosen, and that these obligations are, strictly speaking, pre-contractual, pre-contractual prior to any deliberately entered into agreement. And yet he was the one who famously claimed in an interview that the Palestinian had no face, and that he only meant to extend ethical obligations to those who were bound together by his version of Judeo-Christian and classical Greek origins. In some ways, he gave us the very principle that he betrayed, and this means that anyone and everyone um, um, is not only free, but uh, obligated to extend that principle to the Palestinian people, even though Levinas could not, or precisely because Levinas could not. His failure directly contradicts his formulation of the demand to be ethically responsive to those who exceed our immediate sphere of belonging, but to whom we belong nevertheless, regardless of any question of what we choose or by what existing agreements we are bound, or indeed by what established forms of cultural belonging um, are available. Of course, this raises a question of how there can be an ethical relation to those who cannot appear within the horizon of ethics, who are not rightly considered persons or who are not considered to be the kind of beings with whom one can or must enter into an ethical relation. Here is where a most painful division within Levinas's work continues to haunt those of us who seek ethical re resources there. On the one hand, he tells us that we're claimed by others, including those we've never known, those we still don't know, that we're born into this situation of being compelled to honor the life of the other, every other, whose claim on life comes before our own, which is more important than self-preservation. On the other hand, he claims that this very ethical relation depends upon a specific set of religious and cultural conditions, Judeo-Christian, and that those who are not formed within this tradition are not prepared for ethical life and are not included as those who can make a claim upon those who belong to a narrow conception of the Judeo-Christian West. It's an agonizing contradiction at the heart of Levinas's writing. Is it possible to take the ethical philosophy formulated there, deploy it against the very exclusionary assumptions by which it is sometimes supported, and do something else with it? Can we use Levinas against himself to help in the articulation of a global ethics that would extend beyond the religious and cultural communities that he saw as its necessary limit. Let's take as an example his argument that ethical relations are asymmetrical. The other has priority over me. What does that concretely mean? Does the other not have the same obligation toward me? Why should I be obligated toward another who does not reciprocate in the same way toward me? For Levinas, reciprocity cannot be the basis of ethics, since ethics is not a bargain. It cannot be the case that my ethical relation to another is contingent on that other's ethical relation to me, since that would make my ethical relation less than absolute and binding. It would establish my self-preservation as a distinct and bounded sort of being as more primary than any relation I have to another, which means that in the name of self-preservation, I can do anything to the other. Right? If self-preservation comes first, then any ethical obligation to the other is suspendable by virtue of recourse to self-preservation. Interestingly enough, this is the position that Levinas opposes. No ethics, in his view, can be derived from egoism or from self-preservation. Egoism is, in his view, the defeat of ethics itself. 
I take a little distance from Levinas here, even though I find it a fascinating position. I agree in the refutation of the primacy of self-preservation for ethical thinking, but I want to insist upon a certain intertwinement between that other life, all those other lives, and my own, one that is irreducible to national belonging or communitarian affiliation. In my view, which is surely not mine alone, the life of the other, the life that is not my own or our own is also my life or our life, since whatever sense our life has is derived precisely from this sociality, this being already and from the start dependent on a world of others, constituted in and by a social world, and I would add, a social world sustained by a living environment. In this way, there are surely others distinct from me whose ethical claim upon me is irreducible to an egoistic calculation on my part. But that is because we are, however distinct, also bound to one another. And this is not always a happy or felicitous experience. To find that one's life is also the life of the other, or the life of others, even as this life is distinct and must be distinct, means that one's own personal individual boundary is at once a limit and a site of adjacency, a mode of spatial and temporal nearness and even boundedness. Moreover, the bounded and living appearance of the body is the condition of being exposed to the other, exposed to what I'm calling ethical solicitation, exposed also to seduction, passion, injury, exposed in ways that allow us to be sustained but also in ways that can destroy us. In this sense, and here I will uh, give you a little preview of what's to come, the exposure of the body upon which Levinas's position depends points to its precariousness, although that's not really the word he uses. At the same time, for Levinas, this precarious and corporeal being is responsible for the life of the other, which means that no matter how much one fears for one's own life, no matter how urgent the question of self-preservation becomes, preserving the life of the other is paramount. We might say, if only the Israeli army felt this way. Indeed, this is a form of responsibility that's not easy, since it emerges precisely from a felt sense of precarity. Um, precarity names both the necessity and difficulty of this kind of ethics. It's surely hard to feel at once vulnerable to destruction by the other and yet responsible for the other. And readers of Levinas object all the time to his formulation that we are, all of us, in some sense, responsible for that which persecutes us. And he uses this word persecution with all its terrible resonance. He does not mean by this that we bring about our persecution or that we brought persecution on ourselves or we are the cause of persecution. Not at all. Rather, persecution is the strange and disconcerting name that Levinas gives for an ethical demand that imposes itself upon us against our will. We are, despite ourselves, open to this imposition And though it overrides our will, it shows us that the claims that others make upon us are part of our very sensibility, our receptivity, and our answerability. We are, in other words, called upon, and this is only possible because we are, in some sense, vulnerable to claims from others that we cannot anticipate in advance and for which there is no adequate preparation. For Levinas, there is no other way to understand the ethical reality. Ethical obligation depends upon our vulnerability to the claims of others, and it establishes us as creatures who are fundamentally defined by that ethical relation, the ways in which we are constantly interrupted by alterity, interrupted by the claims that others make upon us. This ethical relation is not a virtue that I have or exercise. It's not an attribute of my person. It's prior to any individual sense of self I might have. 